Hi, today we're going to look at spectrum auctions, spectrum liberalization, and COSA's incomplete triumph. Let's begin. The radio spectrum is that portion of the electromagnetic spectrum which is particularly useful for communications. Now different frequencies in the spectrum have different properties and so they're useful for different sorts of devices. Uh, lower frequencies, for example, are able to penetrate buildings. So you can listen to an AM radio broadcast when you're inside a building, even if the tower broadcasting that signal is miles away. On the other hand, a, if you're trying to get Wi-Fi, then you need a new router on every floor of a building in order to be able to connect to the Internet. Interference can reduce the value of the spectrum. So the spectrum is banded, both across frequencies and over geography. So certain frequencies are allocated to television, to radio, to cell phones, to Wi-Fi, and so forth. In addition, only one AM radio station on a particular frequency is allowed in a given city, a given geographic uh, area. The banding in the United States is illustrated in this picture, although this is only a very simplified uh, representation. The current allocation, it's important to understand, has been determined more by history and by accident than by rational design or spontaneous order. For example, although it's slowly changing, there is still a large fraction of the spectrum which is allocated to over-the-air television broadcasts. Even though almost everyone gets their television by cable, there's still a chunk of spectrum which is being used for this very low-value use even though this spectrum would be much more highly valuable were it used, say, for cell phones. Only a tiny portion of the spectrum uh, has been auctioned, and within this portion, only some of it is actually subject to a free market. So not only has the spectrum not been rationally designed, only a small fraction is subject to a spontaneous order. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Let's look at the traditional allocation of the spectrum. In the early history of radio, the Navy actually tried to make it a government monopoly, analogizing radio to the post office, over which the government also had a monopoly. That plan didn't go so far. Nevertheless, it was said that government control was necessary because the private markets could not or should not allocate spectrum. The could not argument boiled down to scarcity and interference. The scarcity argument is somewhat difficult to understand, since lots of goods are scarce, lakefront property, antiques, first editions of books, and all of these are very well uh, allocated by the market process without any problem. The interference problem was more serious, perhaps, and indeed in the early history of radio, radio stations would try to broadcast on top of one another, and the system was somewhat chaotic. It was coasts, as we'll see in a few minutes, who first took this problem seriously. The should not basically boil down to censorship. Not quite in this dramatic term, but the idea was that the public airwaves should be used for public purposes to benefit you know, the larger community and so forth and not be subject to you know, profit and private uh, enterprise. As a result of this, the Federal Radio Commission was given extensive powers to regulate the spectrum. In particular, they were to prescribe as to the citizenship, character, and financial, technical, and other qualifications of the applicant to operate a station. The ownership and location of the proposed station, the frequencies or wavelengths, and the power desired to be used, the hours of the day the station could operate, the purposes for which the station was to be used, and such other information as it, as it may require. In short, the FCC could award or not award licenses based on public interest, convenience, or necessity. This was very much in contradiction to the First Amendment, and nothing like this would have even been conceivable for something like newspapers. But because this was a new technology, this, was, this contradiction was uh, passed over. Not surprisingly, given these powers, the allocation process was politicized. In his book on Lyndon Johnson, The Means of Ascent, Robert Caro gives an example. So in 1943, Lady Bird Johnson, basically acting as a front, bought a Texas radio station, KTBC. This station had been mired in red tape, but immediately upon her buying it, 
It was allowed to operate for 24 hours a day. It had been more restricted previously. It was allowed to move to a better place on the frequency, and it was allowed to quintuple its uh, power output, and it became very successful. Johnson would also pressure CBS to give uh, his radio station programming for free, and he would shake down local companies to advertise on his radio station and later on the uh, television stations which he controlled. In the process, uh, Lyndon Johnson and Lady Bird Johnson became multimillionaires. In 1959, Ronald Coase published an article challenging the entire empirical and theoretical basis for the FCC and the government allocation of spectrum. He said briefly that political pressures resulted in misallocation of spectrum, and he made the point that an administrative agency lacks the precise monetary measures of benefit and cost provided by the market. In a very Hayekian point, he said that an administrative agency didn't have access to the decentralized information which was necessary to allocate spectrum as well as other goods efficiently. Moreover, looking back at the 1920s and the chaos of radio stations which broadcast on top of one another, he said that the real cause of the trouble was that no property rights were created in these scarce frequencies. Most importantly, in 1959, Ronald Coase laid out very clearly what was to become the Coase Theorem. It was in analyzing the radio problem that Coase came to his great insight, namely that with low transactions costs, the interference problem, that is more generally the problem of spillovers or externalities, can be solved by the market, that is, can be solved by the assignment of property rights. So Coase argued that if property rights in a particular portion of the spectrum were assigned, that even with interference, the property owners would bargain with one another in order to trade those rights so as to maximize the total value of the spectrum. He said, the delimitation of rights is an essential prelude to market transactions, but the ultimate result, which maximizes the value of production, is independent of the legal decision. A very clear statement of the Coase Theorem. For more on that, of course, see our videos on the Coase Theorem. Not too surprisingly, Coase's ideas were given a poor reception by the political process. In testimony in 1959, the first question asked Coase was, tell us, Professor, is this all a big joke? And indeed, as we shall see, Coase's ideas were ignored by the political process for decades. It wasn't only the politicians who thought that Coase was wrong. The economists thought he was wrong, too. Even the ones who were open to the free market, such as at the University of Chicago. Coase's theorem, Coase's argument, challenged 40 years of accepted doctrine, doctrine accepted since Pigou's work in the 1920s on externalities. George Stigler called it a heresy. So seeking to straighten Coase out, Aaron Director at the University of Chicago invited Coase to a dinner along with 20 other economists. In attendance was Director, was Stigler, was Milton Friedman, economists who themselves, Friedman and Stigler, would later go on to win Nobel Prizes. Entering the dinner, it was 20 economists against Coase, one Coase for Coase. Exiting the dinner two hours later, 21 for Coase, none against Coase. Coase had triumphed. He had convinced 20 of the world's best economists that he was right and 40 years of accepted doctrine were wrong. That's how you win a Nobel Prize in economics. Coase had won over the economists, but he had certainly not won over the politicians who basically ignored his ideas for decades. However, in the late 1970s, cellular licenses became much more important, and there were very long delays in getting through the tedious FCC process. Instead of going to auctions, however, the FCC went to lotteries. Basically, this was a crazy system in which anybody in the United States can enter the lottery to become a cellular phone company. Now, uh, of course, most of the entrants couldn't operate a phone company, but paper mill companies came into being which simply submitted off-the-shelf plans. The lottery winners were simply hoping to win the lottery and then resell their rights. There were over 320,000 applications for just 643 uh, cellular licenses. There was a lot of rent-seeking going on, a lot of delays in aggregating these licenses to the national level. It was a very wasteful uh, and unproductive system. In 
Finally, in 1993, the Clinton administration authorized auctions, the first of which was held in July of 1994, almost four decades after COSA's paper. The auction was immediately successful and raised a lot of money. And once the revenue implications were seen, more politicians began to be in favor of these types of auctions. And since July of 1994, the FCC has raised over $60 billion for the U.S. Treasury in these kinds of auctions. So is this a triumph? Auctions were a triumph for Coast, but very much an incomplete one. Only a small share of the spectrum has been auctioned, and an even smaller share has been auctioned with few restrictions on use. Most of the spectrum remains government micromanaged, far more than it has to be the case or is desirable. Large areas of the spectrum, in fact, remain underused, remain fallow. And revenues may even have distracted attention from consumer surplus. So in their eagerness to increase revenues for the U.S. government, the auctioneers have not paid attention to the fact that the real benefit of the auctions is getting underused spectrum, getting spectrum which is ha of low value, moving it to the market process where it has much higher value, where it can increase consumer surplus. In the, all the attention to raise revenues may actually have reduced social welfare beyond what it had to be. Moreover, and most importantly, auctions were only a small part of Coase's liberalization idea. Coase said that the free market, the invisible hand, can apply to spectrum. And today we do not, even today, we do not have a free market in spectrum. So we're far behind still Coase's 1959 insights. Here's some further resources. Of course, Coase's article, very readable from 1959. An excellent uh, modern take, Hazlitt, Porter, and Smith from 2011. Uh, also, Hazlitt and Munoz look at how much uh, spectrum is not being used and how much consumer surplus could still be gained by putting more spectrum into the market process. You should also take a look at some of our other videos on COAST and the COAST theorem. Thanks.